Now, the red line will indicate to you the progress... We Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special treat for you this afternoon. We'll be speaking with the representative of the Muck and Meyer Development Corporation. Sir? I beg your pardon? We're going to do a radio interview, and... Uh, oh, well, certainly. Uh, your name is... Uh, uh, Wade. Wade? Yeah, Wade? Wade Through. Wade Through, I say. You can call me Wade. You are a representative of the Muck and Meyer Development Corporation, is that... Uh, uh, Muck and Meyer Development Corporation, that's right. Is that uh, a large organization? Uh, uh, large and getting larger. Yes, it's going to be tremendous. Well, I... What no, type of an organization is it, Wade? We encourage people mm -hmm. to invest for their own good in land, of course, and uh, we have these entire areas of land throughout the country. We've had some big development areas already uh, that have progressed uh, through our efforts. You, you buy land and then sell oh, it? Oh, yes, yes. We have, uh, we have several places around the country right now. I, I could mention some to you, but it would take a long time. Well, go ahead. We've got a little Well, time. just a couple. We have the Swampland Lagoon. Swampland Lagoons? Yeah, that's out in Florida. Uh-huh. What is that exactly? Is that... Uh, well, it's, it doesn't it's, sound too enticing. Uh, uh, well, you know, no, what's not? I wouldn't say that it was enticing in a sense. But on the other hand, who knows what's under that swamp? That's right. I uh, mean, they discovered marble in Alabama under swamp, you know. Uh -huh. And there's no telling what they'll discover in Florida. May discover part of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> the part that was the under part the that marble. was under the yeah. <laughs> I see. Well, I guess there's a trick, isn't there, to buying land? What should uh, one know before they buy oh, land? Oh, a number of things. One thing is, is weather. Weather is extremely important. Weather? Temperature, yeah. For example, when we bought the great northwestern ice slides, <laughs> we didn't go up there in the summer. <laughs> uh, we're doing great stuff here. I mean, the way I see it, we have uh, the Barren River Straits. We're working on that right now. That's here in Kentucky, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and that's going to be our biggest thing to date. Well, uh, it, could River you describe the, that land for us? Oh, I can. Uh, actually, it's... Uh, You've heard of an arroyo, haven't you? A what? An arroyo? No, sir. That's where rivers used to be. Well, a barren river is going to be sort of seasonal. I mean, we have there the... Uh, so sometimes there's water, sometimes there's not. We, we have the Moses tributary that comes in once a year. <laughs> and uh, actually, the homes there are going to be on pontoons. Pontoons? Yeah, with 100-foot ropes tied to shore. <laughs> And as a side company, in case there's a little trouble, we have the anchor and boat service. I see. Yeah, it's going to be a terrific thing. I, listen, you, don't, uh, you wouldn't like to make a little investment, would you? Uh, how much could one buy a plot of land for in the Barren River Straits? Well, let me put it this way. You may think it's a big investment, but our down payment is so low. Our, our down payment is, well, I'll tell you what we'll do for you. We'll give you an acre of bottom land right in the Barren River for 50 bucks. And that's only a beginning. <laughs> Because the bigger that river gets, the more your money. I worth. suppose it would be. Oh, yes. you'll have fertile land there. Think of your undersea crops. I mean, oceanographers want that area. <laughs> but we're keeping it for people. We're working people like yourself, a family man. You're a family man, are you not yes, married? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're a salaried individual. We keep it for people like that because there's too many rich people in this country right now. At least that's the way I've always felt. How did your company come about with its name, Muck and Meyer? It's, uh... Well, it is kind of catchy. Yes, it is. <laughs> Actually, uh, we were rained out of a couple of places, and uh, we were doing some work in India during the monsoon uh, some years ago. We were going over there to try to, uh, to help the Indians out <coughs> of their money, and uh, well, it got rained on. They call them the monsoons over there, and actually, we were pretty well bogged down. We were going to call it the Bogged Down Construction Company, <laughs> but there was a, one of the fellows married a girl whose maiden name was Bog. You know how that is, and it gets to be a mess. So we call it Muck and Meyer. Muck and Meyer. Yeah. And it's, got, it's got a, uh, a, a lusty type of uh, old western... Yeah, and it helped us because there were a couple of our creditors, and they, they let us <laughs> use the name. It, you know, you name something after somebody, they feel good about it, you know. <laughs> Anyway, it's, uh, it's been a terrific hit ever since that name, as a matter of fact. We started to go, we started to go straight up. We got the plane out of there as quick as we could and uh, <laughs> went to Idaho for a while. Idaho's a big from, potato. From India to Idaho. Yeah, we like really the eyes. Hung up on the eyes. Yeah. yeah, the eyes have it. And uh, at least that's what I've always said. Well, how long have you been with the Muck and Meyer Development Corporation? Twelve days. But the company... <laughs> Having only been with the company for 12 days, how do you know all this stuff about the company? Well, I'm not the kind of guy that just jumps into things. You right. can understand that by looking at me. Right. You know. Actually, this suit I'm wearing ought to tell you something. You know the way a man dresses. It's made of genuine cloth. But I, I'm the kind of guy that does a little research. Right. When I first, I was skeptical, as I know you must be, about right. the Mark and Meyer company. But uh, I did a little research, and I found out that there was a lot of land on their property. And I thought, well, this must be a good place to get in, you know, to go to work for these people and find out. So I went over, and they said I was what they were looking for, a guy who really knew where it was and was going to try to get it. And you were hired on, right on the spot. I was hired right on the spot, actually, because we didn't have any chairs in the office. And um, 
I went right to work immediately for them. I, I took their brochure and I, I read it, read the page through. And um, I knew right away that, you know, those 12 sentences were going to make me a rich man. What were those 12 sentences? What did they say? I don't know what they said exactly, but they said a lot of things like keep your chin up. And of course, in our land, you kind of have to because, like I say, we <laughs> seem to have gotten a lot of rainy places. <laughs> Wasn't I reading a few uh, few weeks ago where the Muck and Meyer Development Corporation has uh, come under congressional fire, is going to be uh, investigated by the Senate Judiciary Committee for uh, unfair developing tactics? Well, I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to come clean with you because I like your face. I'm serious about this. That's just a disgruntled employee who made up a lot of false material, a lot of false forms, and sent them to the government. We welcome that investigation. I mean, we welcome it. We're proud of what we've done, and that's this disgruntled employee, Sam Sorehead. He was there. He worked for us for a while. As a matter of fact, I took his place. I see. You took Sam Sorehead's place. Huh? Sam left suddenly. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think he'll show up at the hearing. But uh, <laughs> we have a thorough and complete operation here, and I know that once the Senate investigating committees find out about it, and realize that their checks are in the mail. <laughs> Wade, have you uh, invested in land from Muck and Meyer yourself? Let me tell you, pal. I'm not a guy, I'm not a front runner. I'm a person who has invested himself. I've got a beautiful home in the Swampland Lagoon. You have a home in, That's the, correct. in the Swampland. Beautiful. Split level. Split level? That's right, split level. I didn't intend it to be that way, but one end of it just sunk in the ground. <laughs> sunk into the swamps, is it? Oh. I guess it's a little tricky building on swamps. Well, it's a little tricky, actually, but if you're fast on your feet, you can get out of there alive. <laughs> well, Wade through of the Muck and Meyer Development Corporation, I want to thank you for being on our show this afternoon. It's been very enlightening, and I realize you have to run. You mentioned something about an appointment. Is yeah, that's right, pal. I've got an appointment at the federal building. Another land deal? Oh, I think this might be a time deal. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Ferguson, and in my radio career, I've had the opportunity to do many things. One of the biggest highlights was being production director for WHS Radio, a 50,000-watt clear channel broadcast station in Louisville, Kentucky. I was production director from 1970 to 1979, and during that time, I was given almost full reign to produce whatever radio shows I might be interested in producing. Can you imagine that? Whatever I could envision, and they were paying me for this. Well, actually, I could produce anything I wanted to in addition to my regular production schedule and my weekend radio show. But still, the near total freedom to explore all the possibilities and get it on the air. I could do this because I won many awards along the way. And it was like each award said, you're good to go, buddy. Keep on keeping on. It said that to me, but more important, that was also said to my boss, Mr. Hugh Barr who was the station general manager and a very nice person to work with. I think he hired me because he thought I was creative and knowledgeable in broadcast electronics. Without going into too much detail here, the station was having growing pains, moving away from old radio engineer-only operated equipment to a modern jock-operated audio board known as Combo. So this involved all the engineers, their unions, and the announcers, and their union. In addition to on-air combo, he wanted the production people to be able to operate their own equipment. I didn't envy his position. It was like trying to pull two large mountains together with a lasso. And I was part of that lasso. He knew I was thoroughly capable of operating my own production equipment. He also knew that I knew pretty much everything the engineers knew. So I could talk turkey with them instead of getting a technical snow job. No more maintenance slips in the general inner office mail. They would now be hand-delivered downstairs to maintenance immediately. Long story short, I was the canary in the cave, but I carried a shotgun, the station manager's backing. So if you want to just get to the high points, start at 1970. If you're interested in how I got there, just let it roll. But keep in mind, you're the editor. All you have to do is hit next when needed. Thank you. Radio, the beginning. Radio began long before any of us were born. The frequencies that radio uses to operate on are as old as Alpha, the beginning of this universe. It took man many years to learn how to use those frequencies to make radio signals. In the very beginning of radio, he didn't even know how to transmit his own voice. 
He was reduced to dots and dashes. He wrote a letter code made up of those dots and dashes. It was called the Morse Code. It was used first on telegraph lines, strung along poles from coast to coast, and under the ocean around the world. Then that code was embraced by radio as its main form of communication. Radio became the newer telegraph. The main difference between them was that radio didn't need wires to transmit from point A to point B. Radio could go instantly around the world from point A through Z and all points in between instantly. Throughout the world and the universe, these radio signals traveled and would tell of many stories of distress and drama, joy and triumph, major news events in progress. Radio was found to be indispensable. Most all ships and planes had wireless telegraph sets. But there were many who knew that radio could be so much more than dots and dashes, and they spent hours and hours, months and years, unlocking the possibilities of transmitting the human voice through the air. Man's essence teleported to all parts of the world while he stood in just one small micron of space. And yes, at some point, in some experiment, voice was sent successfully wirelessly. It was crude, the voice very distorted, sounding more like static than human, but the voice was controlling the static. From there on, it was a race to improve the quality. Man had achieved one of the greatest dreams of civilization, wireless transmission of the human voice. The very first voice signals on the air were limited. It was called push to talk. The mic had a push button switch on it. You listened, then pushed the button to talk. Transmissions were short and to the point. But somehow, as time passed, it seemed like radio kept showing up at more major world events. Major news stories started coming in by radio first. It would be hours, if not days, before newspapers would have it. And so the commercialization of radio continued. Broadcast stations now began to proliferate in major cities. These were much more than push-to-talk transmissions. These stations were on the air for hours and hours at a time, relaying the news of the day from around the world. The effect was magnetic in the truest sense of the word. By the time I was born in 1944, radio already had a long history of achievements. It now proudly stood its vigil, like a watchdog in the night, to warn others of approaching danger. And then, it began to entertain the listening audience between the disasters and warnings. Yes, push to talk was gone. These babies were cooking. Music on radio was now commonplace, and people loved it. It was mesmerizing. People were connected to people around the world. And we found out that some people were very different than us. Radio was tremendous at painting visual word pictures. The first and the get it started, get it started. It's right and it's right. It's right and terrible. Oh. It could take you there in an instant wherever there happened to be. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. Radio just connected you to your town, to your state, to your country, to the world and beyond. Well, maybe now we are getting ahead of the story. So much for the radio overview. Let's get on with my radio dreams. Here are some basic facts we'll be dealing with in detail. I was bitten by the radio bug by six years old. My grandfather had been bitten by the same bug, and he helped me discover how to scratch it. I was radio broadcasting throughout the local neighborhood by 12. And you'll have a front row seat following the adventure, from 5 watts to 50,000 watts. And it's all documented on tape. This is a one-of-a-kind interactive documentary, which has taken a lifetime to produce. And it's dedicated to all children everywhere who have radio dreams. This is Jim Ferguson's documentary that encompasses some 50 hours of material, making it one of the world's longest documentaries. 
with audio recordings dating back to 1956 when I was a 12-year-old kid nursing one of the worst cases of radio bug bite ever known to mankind. But my story really begins a lot earlier than that. I mean, I just didn't fall out of the sky as a 12-year-old. I was raised in the country in West Palm Beach, Florida, a few miles out of town. The earliest thing I remember was my grandfather and grandmother coming to live with us when I was six or seven. A few days before they arrived, my family, my father and mother and sister and brother, were hard at work packing up things in the garage and putting them into cardboard boxes. We stacked and we piled and that wall of boxes climbed toward the garage ceiling. To hide all those boxes, we hung a cloth blanket to make a wall. The garage side door now became this small apartment's front door, which opened onto a breezeway that was about 15 feet wide and connected the main house to the garage. The next thing I remember was that my grandfather had built a garden area a good walk from the main house. This specific area had been chosen because of the heavy black muck soil, ideal for growing. He grew corn, potatoes, many varieties of tomatoes, and flowers. He wore khaki pants and a khaki shirt every day, with just a scrub of facial hair. He was slightly heavyset and soft-spoken. In the garden, he had a small work table, but the main thing was a homemade windmill. It was impressive, a 30-foot tall wooden tower with this airplane thing with big steel blades and an airplane-like tail. Sometimes when the wind really blew hard, I thought it would take off. The windmill furnished water for the garden. There were no power lines to run a pump. There was also another building in the garden area. It was a glass house. Well, to a seven-year-old, that's what it looked like. Actually, it was a large storage shed made out of large window frames on all sides. It was maybe 10 feet by 10 feet with a rainproof roof and glass on all sides. This was my grandfather's storage shed, with more cardboard boxes stacked to the ceiling in some areas. As I said, this was my grandfather's stuff, and some of his stuff was magic. He went to this garden every morning at 8 o'clock. He would come home for lunch and then back to the garden till 5 o'clock. I remember there were occasions when he would have to go looking for things in the glass shed, and if I were lucky enough to be in the area, I would be right there by his side as he searched. Somehow it didn't usually matter what he was looking for. I knew that there were two or three boxes of stuff in there that were pure magic, filled with all kinds of radio and telephone parts, parts from another time, parts that held secrets. How did they work? Old telephone headsets and microphones, dials and coils, tubes, some of the biggest radio tubes I'd ever seen. I can't really express the depth of my attraction to these things, but my grandfather understood because these were his things and he had thought enough of them to pack them away, to save them. And when he would open one of these boxes, it was to me like being a pirate opening a lost buried treasure chest. I'm sure my eyes were as big as saucers and probably glazed over at the same time. I don't mean to make this a big deal, but it was. And I know that he knew it was because he would always find just that right item to give to me. I was as much like him, I guess, as he was. That old telephone headset, or whatever radio part it was he gave me, would turn into hours, weeks, and months of experimenting, wiring it in different ways. Which way worked best? Where do you put the battery? This went on every four or five months for two to three years. I was constantly amazed by the stuff he had, and the stuff that he gave me. He passed away in the garden, and I missed him. I didn't go to his funeral. It took a while to put everything into perspective. But life does go on. He had wanted me to have those three boxes of magic when he passed. And in fact, that's what happened. And I played with and experimented with all that stuff for two or three years. I missed those times with him in the garden. But his gifts helped. It was like a part of him still was there, his essence. In retrospect, he lived on inside of me. I say all this just to let you know what kind of kid I was by the time I was 12 and our story begins with my first audio recordings. And just a suggestion on how you might listen to this production. The commentaries describe the upcoming segments. So play each commentary, then begin playing the described segment. 
Some segments are longer than others. So remember, this is interactive. Just advance to the next commentary. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. You cry all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Cry all the time. Well, you ain't nothing but a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. It's 1956. And about all you could hear on the radio that year was this guy, Elvis. During this production, we'll be checking out a ton of number one music hits for each year we're talking about. Music that I grew up with and later played on the radio. And music that you like so much, you made them certified number one billboard hits. Well, let's get on with it. I was going to call this the Jim Ferguson Radio Active File. It is a chronology of my radio career. But the more I think about it, it's like having been bitten by the radio bug. I was bitten at a young age. When? Well, I can't remember wanting to be anything else but on the radio, talking to hundreds of people at the same time. It was exciting and simultaneously terrifying. The following segments serve as testimony to the dreams of a child. It was 1956. I was 12, and thanks to my first cheapy tape recorder, these moments are preserved. These tapes are well over 50 years old. But as you listen, I think you can hear the germ of sincerity. They're presented as an inspiration to kids everywhere who have great loves and dreams of accomplishment. I think I can hear a 12-year-old now scratching his radio bug bite. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is WDTR Radio signing on for another day of broadcasting. WDTR is owned and operated by WDTR Incorporated and operates on a sign frequency of 650 kilocycle. WDTR has a maximum output of 5 watts. This is WDTR, an experimental station in West Palm Beach. Stay tuned now for NBC Radio News on the hour. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. What is that right so Join me home. We'll have some fun when the clock strikes. One. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. We're gonna rock, rock, rock till the rock daylight. We're gonna rock, we're gonna rock around the clock tonight. Throughout this odyssey, there will be many segments called the commercials. Commercials were like movies in Fast Forward. They could be done in a couple of hours, and they stood up by themselves. Here's commercial series number one from 1956, as uh, I saw it as a 12-year-old. We are not going to interrupt this record. Yes, we are. Jim Ferguson, Special News, Cape Canaveral. We understand Mercury Control was in direct radio contact with astronaut Clarence on the moon. We asked them how the transmission arrived here that distance. They replied, On the wings of the snow. Calling Cape Canaveral. Calling Cape Canaveral. Calling Cape Canaveral. This is Colonel Clarence Capricorn. This is Colonel Clarence Capricorn. Do you receive? Do you receive? Over. This is Cape Canaveral. Go ahead, Colonel Capricorn. This is Colonel Capricorn back again. Boys, you'll never believe this, but even the moon has a three-heart center. This is Mercury Control. What part of the moon are you on, anyway? North, Dixie. <laughs> this record to bring you a special bulletin. Jim Ferguson, Special News, Cape Canaveral. We understand from Mercury Control that astronaut Clarence Clappercorn is no longer in orbit. Mercury Control is trying frantically to reach him by radio. For a direct report, we take you to Mercury Control. Come in, Mercury Control, please. Cape Canaveral calling Colonel Clappercorn. Do you receive? Over. This is Colonel Clappercorn. Go ahead, Cape Canaveral. Colonel Clappercorn, what is your position? Repeat again. What is your position? Over. This is Clappercorn back to Canaveral. Man, you know this is my lunch hour. I'm at 21 North Military Trail, Dust Truck Store, over at 32900. This is Mercury Control back to Colonel Clarence Clappercorn. 
Tell me, sir, why do you eat there? Why not? There's no better place to eat in the whole wide world. This is Capricorn Clear. And you'll be clear, too. Or I think you're clear. Clear out of this world when you eat at Duff's Drug Store, 21 North Military Trail, Overland 32900. Nineteen fifty six was a very good year for me. My mom and dad did everything they could to support me. My mom got me my first tape recorder, which was just what I needed. What a gift. What a learning tool for someone wanting to be in radio. But she also got me something else, something even more important. My first radio transmitter. And that was the icing on the cake. She was working at the airport as a civilian secretary in the Air Force Military Air Transport Service, known as MATS. She worked for four or five department heads. She did all of their typing and filing. Well, somehow, she had been telling the guys about me, and one of the guys said, I have something he might enjoy. It turned out to be what was called the One Tube Wonder. It was a low-power AM transmitter in a small metal box with air holes all around to let the heat escape from the tube, which you could see glowing inside. The officer who had it was electronically inclined. He knew what he was doing, and he had made certain electronic modifications to this one-tube wonder, which made it much more powerful than the normal one-tube wonder. When he gave it to my mom, he had told her that it would really get out and that I should take care and try not to interfere with other licensed broadcast stations as I could get in trouble. So I always tried to operate it in a clear spot on the dial. He had also told her it should always have an antenna connected to it when it was on. Otherwise, it could burn itself up for not getting rid of the energy it was generating. It was like a sports car souped up. The more the engine puts out, the more likelihood of a catastrophic failure. PlayStation WDTR's transmitter did have a few quirks, but he was right. It did get out, and I was constantly trying to get out even better. Under the guise of his advice of keeping a good antenna on it, I strung a 300-foot long wire antenna from a 60-foot tall tree to the pump house, which I was using as the studio transmitter site. All went well until the lightning storm. The long wire antenna gave me another mile or so of additional coverage area, but it also attracted things like lightning. Not good when you're wearing earphones listening to your station as you were DJing. I don't remember much about that incident. Only one moment I was sitting in a chair during my radio show, and the next thing I knew I was on the floor trying to get up. It hadn't been a direct hit because I wouldn't be here now, but it was close enough for the long wire antenna to attract enough primary lightning charge to arc through the earphones to ground through me. I often wondered what that might have sounded like on the radio at the time. The transmitter was still on when I came to. I always kept an eye out for weather conditions after that when I was broadcasting. It took another month or so before I could wear earphones. On the air, my PlayStation WDTR was full of station promotions. I had more promotions on the air than anybody. Yes, it's true. Rebel Radio has a treasure tree, and it's located someplace in West Palm Beach. Your job? Find it. Find the tree, and you find the money. Five dollars is yours for the finding on the Rebel Radio Treasure Tree. If you find the tree, phone me at Overland 32862. Again for you, Overland 36862. Tune down the highway doing 79. I'm a twin pipe pilot. 
Papa and I'm feeling fine. Hey, man, dig that. Was that a red stop sign? <laughs> this is the Rebel Radio. Heed speed time. If you're speeding, heed it. Remember, speed can kill, and it can kill you at any time. So don't speed. Take it easy on the highways. Watch out. My rod about a quarter to nine. I got to make a date with that chick of mine. I cross the center line. Man, you got to make time. <laughs> Yeah, this is Jumpin' Jim at a PM for Radio 1 WDTR. We go every night on the Big Sound, and the Big Sound only goatees on Radio 1, 1650 on your radio dial, WDTR, Jiminy AM. Go, Jim Daddy! Go, Jim Daddy! Oh, my old man's a dustman, me with the dustman that... And what does your father do, or what does your father wear? Well, if it's impossible employment, if it's digging ditches, if it's uh, hanging from the tree by his left hand, well, that's impossible employment. And chances are you'll be able to win our impossible employment contest. Yes, the Rebel Radio Impossible Employment Contest is open now. If your father does something that's impossible for employment, write us at Overland 3, uh, rather, Overland 3, 2862, that's our phone number, or write us at Route 1, Box 209, and care of radio station W. WDTR. And chances are you'll win the Rebel Radio Impossible Employment Contest. I, uh, I found a police dog in my dustbin. Well, how do you know he's a police dog? He had a policeman with him. <laughs> That's right, you're the boss. We don't know what to play, really. And if you have a special selection that you would like us to play, write us. This is the Rebel Radio Write-In Contest. That's right, write us here at Route 1, Box 209, Dillman Road, and Curve Radio Station, WDTR, and we'll play what you want. You are the queen. Man, when push comes to shove, when it comes down to love, you're a horse. In the middle of the night, when the moon is shining bright, you're the boss. From the very beginning, my multi-interest in both the electronics and the programming side of radio was very advantageous in pursuing my radio career. To be able to figure out how to build an audio mixer board at 12 years old by building four audio amplifier kits, then running the separate audio input links up to a common four-volume control board, and tying the four audio outputs together, well, looking back, I think it was near genius. It maybe not genius, but pretty smart for a 12-year-old, particularly when getting a real audio mixer board would have been impossible money-wise. But it did require a lot of work building those four audio amp kits and then wiring them in just the right manner to make a mixer board. And then putting a VU or volume meter on the mixer board to show how loud the audio signal was. But then wiring it to the transmitter at just the right volume level was touchy and ultimately required the addition of a special control just for that. If the signal from the mixer board to the transmitter was too loud, the transmitter audio would be distorted. If it were too weak, the radio signal would get lost in the noise. So I would listen to a regular station on my radio receiver, then tune it quickly to my station and try to compare the two audio levels. If the other station was louder, I would adjust the special volume control on the mixer output feed to the transmitter. If my station was louder, I would turn it down to try to match the other station. It took a lot of testing. I can recall working on it for many days and to all hours of the night, trying to get it right. So from 1956, here's an audio air check of me testing and adjusting the transmitter audio level on the air. Repeat, this is at a 100% modulation.
Ladies and gentlemen, this is the broadcasting voice of the Palm Beaches, WDTR. Radio Wonderful. Stand by now for NBC Radio News. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is WDTR West Palm Beach. As I mentioned earlier, practice is the road to achievement. The ability to read well in radio is vital. Reading aloud is a whole different situation than reading silently. And to record your voice as you do so gives you the opportunity to hear yourself abstractly on playback. You can listen very closely without the distraction of actually reading. And we know that Erwin Don grew fair, some prisoner had to swing. Right in we went with soul intent on death and dread and doom. The hangman with his little bag went shuffling through the gloom. And each man trembled as he crept into his numbered tomb. That night the empty corridors were full of forms of fear. And up and down the iron town, stole feet we could not hear. And through the bars that hide the stars, white faces seemed to peer. He lay as one who lies in dreams in a pleasant meadow land. And the watchers watched him as he slept and could not understand how one could sleep so sweet a sleep for the hangman close at hand. But there is no sleep when men must weep who never yet have wept. So we, the fool, the fraud, the knave, that endless vigil kept. And through each brain on hands of pain, another's terror crept. Alas, it is a fearful thing to feel another's guilt. For right within, the sword of sin pierced to its poison hilt, and as molten lead with the tears we shed, for the blood we had not spilt. The warders with their shoes of felt crept by each padlocked door, and peeped and saw with eyes of awe gray figures on the floor, and wondered why men knelt to pray who never prayed before. Well, all I want is hard to die. Come along with me, we're feeling wild To be ever love and true and fair To run her fingers through my hair At 13, an older friend of mine wanted to start a tape-syndicated gospel radio show and asked if I wanted to help. He had secured a building to house his youth outreach program and he had also secured a radio audio mixer board from a church that no longer was broadcasting. This thing looked like a B-29 with tons of control knobs and meters and buttons. Boy, the radio bug was biting hard. This thing even had two turntables. My friend had no idea how to operate it, but it was just what I'd been dreaming for. Stand back. My time had come. It's time for Youth on the Beam. Once again, we're here with more music, the best music this side of heaven. Who can stand against us? He's the captain of our fate. Here's Miss Georgia Lee with A Christian Cowboy. The devil a rustler and many are his men who ride the plains and valleys branding souls with death and sin bring in the strays for the Lord 
Roger Lee with The Christian Cowboy. Coming up, it sounds like a good day at PlayStation KXBT. A jock, I think, needs to match the energy level of the music he's playing. She's much too nice to rearrange Additional thought. I call this segment the man with the mic. It's one of those observations that one can only make later in life, because at the time it was happening, one's just too close to notice. I can recall three specific instances where my radio bug addiction was peaked, or should I say, where I was green with envy. In West Palm Beach, when I was growing up, there was a teen dance at the Civic Center, and I can recall going many times. I would usually wind up standing around the MC area. He would intro the records and announce record dedications. I just watched him work, and I remember that shiny chrome mic that he talked into, and how it sounded on the speakers around the dance floor. And I wondered if I would sound as good as he did if I were doing it. Well, they had special guest DJs from time to time, and once I was lucky enough to get to do it. I don't have any idea what I said at the time, but I do recall walking on air for the rest of that night and for many days to come. I recall another interest I had at the time was Little League Baseball. And at the baseball field, they had a PA system with a guy up in the press box above the concession stand. I would listen also to his voice ring out across the bleachers and field. It was strong and clear, concise and confident. From time to time, I could catch a glimpse of him holding this small green metal mic as he held it to his lips. It had a push-to-talk button on the mic, and you could hear a small click as he pushed it to speak. The speakers were mounted on poles around the field. They were outdoor PA horn types. His voice coming through them was very concise. I remember thinking, I could do that. I never got the chance, but I remember thinking about it. The third incident in my Man with the Mic segment had to do with an actual radio station in West Palm Beach. The station was WEAT Radio. Its programming was mostly smooth jazz at night. It was in the same building as WEAT TV, and they would leave the side door unlocked until midnight or thereabouts so people could come and go after the 11 p.m. TV newscast. Well, I knew one of the young camera operators, and he had introduced me to the all-night announcer for WEAT Radio. And from that time on, I would drop in and visit him when he was on the air from time to time. I would sit to his right side. There was a turntable console between us. I would watch him work, how he queued up the next record on the second turntable, how he worked the knobs on the audio board, how he held the toggle switch that put his microphone on the air. At about 2.25 or so in the morning, he would usually take a quick break, and he would say, come over here and sit down at the console. And if I don't make it back in time, open the mic and say, this is WEAT Radio West Palm Beach, then turn off the mic and hit the switch to turn on the next record. Well, the first two or three times, he made it back just in time. But the fourth time, he didn't. And I was so surprised when I realized I was going to be on the air. But I did it, and it went perfect. He showed up a couple of minutes later and asked how it went. And I said, great but I think he'd been listening to it somewhere else in the building, just to be sure. 
I guess what I'm saying in this segment is my fascination with microphones is so obvious to me now, but at the time I didn't realize when I was around the man with a mic, I probably had that kid outside the candy store look. And then I was lucky enough to become the man with the mic myself. Dream, 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 dream. <whistles> Coming up, more play practice on PlayStation KXBT. Party Line was another operating under pressure test. There was only one turntable, so you had to ad-lib as you changed records. The test was to see how many records you could play in half an hour and try to sound professional with just one turntable. Hello, this is Party Line, and we have music for you. The preview of the big band Battle of the Bands, that's what we have tonight. Leading off with Eddie Cochran. I'm a quarter of the first, I'm a quarter of the horror. About a working old summer just to try to pull a car. Remember that one? And also we have another Cochran favorite. It's called Come On Everybody Now. We want everybody to come on. The Battle of the Sounds from KXBT, AM and FM. Party gonna rack tonight. We also got Roy Hamilton and Don't Let Go Baby and we won't, I swear we won't. Roy Hamilton, a KXVT flashback. That's right, Roy Hamilton at WDTR and KXBT flashback, and on we go the musical show, another Oli Goli flashback. Billy and Lily and La Di Da. That's about 1956 music there, and then Elvis came along right on their trail with that one. down and cry over you. I'm gonna sit right down and cry over you. And if you ever say goodbye, if you ever even try, I'm gonna sit right down and cry over you. That's right, Elvis sat right down and cried, and then Paul Anka says, Dee Dee Dinah, I love you so. Well, Frankie Avalon came along with D.D. Dinah, but Paul Anka came along with Just Plain Dinah. Just Plain Dinah, that's all just plain a million copies. This is Party Line on KXBT AM and KXBT FM. You're young and you're so old. This is my darling, I've been told. On KXBT, Battle of the Bands, and that's called Diana. This is Miss Brenda Lee, Nashville, Tennessee fame, Rock the Bob. sort of fast to get all of them in. Ricky Nelson came along about 1957 or 58 with waiting in school all day long. Waiting in school for you. I've been waiting in school all day long, waiting on the bell to ring for white for home. I throw my book on the table, pick up the telephone. Hello, baby, let's get some going. Heading down to the drugstore to get a quarter of pop for a nickel and a few box thing with that rock. The cool cow baby gonna take the news. Let's go in the baby doll shoe. That's a one, a two, a 
out of the door. Three, four, come on and let's play some more. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Here's uh, Jerry Lewis and Little Queenie. I love you truly do. I got a lot of simple and a star coming down the aisle. Woo, KXBT party line. I got a big old that she did. She smiled all over the place, and then she looked up with her big, big, big blue beautiful eyes and said, on KXBT Party Line telling us all about what she said and also on Party Line Buddy Knox with Party Doll. Oh, That's what we're going to do. We're going to make love with records. Larry Williams came along with Bowie Maroney. This is Jack's BT Party Line. I got a girl named Bonnie Maroney. Yeah, she's as thin as a stick of macaroni now, huh? She's as thin as a stick of macaroni. Yeah, it's not her fault. She's been taking Metrocal. <laughs> oh, well, that's what happens when you go to school. You want to look good. Yeah. Hey. Got me for Cinder High School in the USA. An only go they flashback. That's Tommy Facinda, High School USA on KXBT Party Line. We also have Norvis Jorvis in Transfusion. Need a little blood action there. All over the highway, most likely. Drive slow. Tune down the highway doing 79. I'm a 20 pipe popper and a P15. Hey, man, dig that. Was that a red stop sign? That's what we're going to do. We're going to stop right here and switch over to a better record. <laughs> Jim Dandy and uh, Laverne Baker get together. They do something like Jim Dandy to the rescue. Jim Dandy on Party Line KXBT. Jim Dandy to the rescue. I'm coming. Jim Dandy to the rescue. Hear you loud and clear. Jim Dandy to the rescue. Go, Jim Dandy. Go, Jim Dandy. And we're going to move right along with the KXBT Party Line show. Coming to the rescue, Jim Dandy and the Charlie Browns. Everybody's always picking on me. I guess it's just because I'm so fine, as the fiestas say. That's about 56 ash action. Ash in there? <laughs> The fiesta isn't so fine. And then the feet would come along and messed up the whole thing. Soft and swinging. The feet would then come softly to me.
That's about 1957 action. There, the Fleetwoods and Come Soft to Me and the Jimmy Rogers and Kisses Sweeter Than Wine. Well, when I was a young man who'd never been kissed, I got to thinking it over how much I missed. So I got me girl and I kissed her and then and then. Oh, Lord, I kissed her again because she had a kissed Rogers, there was some swing in action. She had kisses sweeter than wine, and because she had kisses sweeter than wine, Sam Cooke says, I'll come running back to you, baby. Oh, sir, have you found someone new to do you? Just call my name, I'm not ashamed. I'll come running back to you. But unfortunately, when I came running back, she didn't take me. So now, I'm at a place called Lonesome Town. This is KXBT Party Line. If you want a record played, call us at Overland 32862, and we'll get your request on the air. KXBT Party Line. There's a place where I go to cry. We move to a place with Roy Arborson, and it's only the lonely know how I feel tonight. KXBT Party Line Flashback. Jim and Appeal swinging the music for you. If you want a dedication, phone us here at Overland 32862. We'll get it on for you, boo boo. Flashback information there. Only the lonely know how I feel tonight. This is KXBT Party Line. This is Mark Denning. With Teen Angel. That fateful night, the car was gone. Upon the railroad track. I put it out and we would say, but you Denning with a little Teen Angel action there on KXVT AM and FM Party Line. These are the platters with an oldie goldie recall, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Phone us here at Overland 32862 and ask for Studio C and the Flashback Party Line. Line. What? These are the Nocturnes and the Viscounts in Harlem. Or something. Harlem Nocturne by the Viscounts. Real swing number. Get your girl. Mm. You let it play a half a second longer. Well, that I thought you were Speedy Gonzalez. I mean, you know. In addition to longer music shows, I started to want to do longer radio programs too, like suspense shows. So with almost no technical production capabilities, I found an article in a magazine and gave it a shot. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
This is your host, Jim Ferguson. Welcome again to Awake. Tonight's story, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. Adapted for radio by Jim Ferguson. This is another in a series to keep you awake. Ladies and gentlemen, the monsters are due. It was Saturday afternoon on Maple Street and the late sun retained some of the warmth of a persistent Indian summer. People along the street marveled at winter's delay and took advantage of it. Old Mr. Van Horn, the patriarch of the street, who lived alone, had moved his power saw out on his lawn and was ready to start fashioning new pickets for his fence. It was 4.40 p.m. A football game blared from a portable radio on the front porch, blending with the other sounds of a Saturday afternoon in October. Maple Street, 4.40 p.m. Maple Street, and its last calm and reflective moments before the monsters came. Steve Brand, 40-ish, a big man in an old ex-marine set of dungarees, was washing his car when the lights flashed across the sky. Everyone on the street looked up at the sound of the whoosh and a brilliant flash that dwarfed the sun. What was that? Steve called across at his neighbor, Don Martin, who was fixing a bent spoke on his son's bicycle. Martin, like everyone else, was cupping his hands over his eyes to stare up at the sky. Looked like a meteor, didn't it? I didn't hear any crash, though. Nope, nothing except that roar. Steve's wife came to the porch, and then she said, Steve, what was that? Guess it was a meteor, honey. <laughs> Came off of close, didn't it? She went back into the house and became suddenly conscious of something. All along Maple Street, people paused and looked at one another as a gradual awareness took hold. All the sounds had stopped, all of them. There was a silence now. No portable radio, no lawnmowers. No clickety-clack of sprinklers that went round and round on front lines. There was a complete silence. Mrs. Sharp, 55 years of age, was talking on the telephone, giving a cake recipe to her cousin at the other end of the town. When all of a sudden the circuit clicked off. Mr. Van Horn was right in the middle of sawing a one-by-four piece of pine when the power went off. Steve Brand's wife, Agnes, came out on the porch to announce that the oven had stopped working. There was no current or something, and would Steve please look at it? But Steve couldn't look at it at that moment because he was preoccupied with a hose that suddenly refused to give any more water. Across the street, Charlie Farnsworth, fat and dumpy in a loud Hawaiian sports shirt that featured hula girls with pineapple baskets on their heads, barged angrily out toward the road, darning any radio outfit that manufactured a portable with the courtesy to shut off in the middle of a third quarter forward pass. Hey, did you hear that? 
Did you see that missile? Voices built up on top of voices until suddenly there was no more silence. There was a conglomeration of questions and protest, of plaintiff's references to half-cooked dinners, half-watered lawns, half-washed cars, and half-finished telephone conversations. Did it have anything to do with the meteor? That was the main question, the one most asked. Pete Van Horn disgustedly threw aside his, the cord of his power mower and announced to the group of people who were collected around Steve Brand's station wagon that he was going over to Brennan Avenue to see if the power was off there also. He disappeared into his backyard and was last seen heading into the backyard of the house behind his. Steve Brand, his face wrinkled with perplexity, leaned against his car door and looked around at the neighbors who had collected. Just doesn't make sense. Why should the power go off all of a sudden and the phone line be dead? Don Martin whipped bicycle grease off his fingers. Maybe some kind of an electrical storm or something. Dumpy Charlie's voice was unpleasant and high. Just doesn't seem likely. Sky's just as blue as anything. Not a cloud. No lightning, no thunder, no nothing. How could it be a storm? <laughs> Mrs. Sharp's face was lined with years, but more deeply by frustrations of earlier widowhood. Well, it's a terrible thing when a phone company can't keep its line open. It's just a terrible thing. What about my portable radio? Ohio State's got the ball on the Southern Methodist 18-yard line. They threw a pass and the darn thing goes off just then. Charlie picked his teeth with a dirty thumbnail. Steve, why don't you go downtown and check with the police? Oh, they'll probably think we're crazy or something. A little power failure, and right away, everybody gets frustrated and everything. Just isn't a power failure. If it was, we'd still be able to get a broadcast on the portable. Oh, all right, I'll go downtown and we get all this straightened out. Steve opened the door to his station wagon. He inched his big frame across the front seat behind the wheel and turned on the ignition and pushed the starter. But the car would not start. Doesn't that beat all? It was working fine before. Maybe you're out of gas. No, I, I just had it filled up. What's it mean? Charlie Forns with piggish little eyes flapped open and shut. It's just as if, just as if everything had stopped. Better walk downtown, Steve. Steve got out of the car. They said, it couldn't be a meteor. A, a meteor couldn't do this. He looked off and thought for a moment, and then he nodded. Come on, let's go. They started to walk away when they heard the boy's voice. Tommy Bishop, age 16, had stepped out in front of the others and was calling to them. Mr. Brand, Mr. Brand, you better not go. Steve took a step back toward him. Why not? They don't want you to. Steve and Don exchanged a look. Who doesn't want us to? Tommy looked up towards the sky. Them. Them? Who are them? Whoever was up there that came overhead. Steve walked slowly back towards the boy and stopped close to him. What, Tommy? Whoever was in that thing that came over? I, I don't think they want us to leave here.
Steve knelt down in front of the boy. What do you mean, Tommy? What are you talking about? They don't want us to leave. That's why they shut everything off. What makes you say that? Whatever gave you that idea? Mrs. Sharp pushed her way through to the front of the crowd. That's the craziest thing I ever heard. Just about the craziest thing I ever heard. Tommy could feel the unwillingness to believe him. It's always that way. In every story I've ever read about a spaceship landing from, from outer space. Mrs. Sharp wangled a bony finger in front of Tommy's mother. If you keep talking like that, you better take this boy up to bed. He's been reading too many comic books or seeing too many movies or something. Sally Bishop's face threatened. She gripped Tommy's shoulders tightly. Tommy, she, she said softly, stop that kind of talk, honey. Steve's eyes never left the boy's face. That's all right. We'll be right back. You'll see. That wasn't a ship or anything like that. It was just sort of a meteor or something. <laughs> He turned to the group, trying to weight his words with an optimism he didn't quite feel. No doubt it did have something to do with this power failure and the rest of it. The meteors can do strange things like sunspots and things like that. That's right, Don said as if picking up a cue. Like sunspots. That's the kind of thing they can raise cane with radio reception all over the world. And this thing being so close, well, there's no telling what sort of stuff it can do. He wet his ne- lips nervously. Come on, Steve, we'll go downtown and see if there isn't what's causing this thing. Once again, the two men started away. Mr. Brian! Tommy's voice was defiant and frightened at the same time. He pulled away from his mother and ran after them. Please, Mr. Ryan, please don't leave here! Something about the intense little face made everybody turn and duck. Something about the words that carried such emphasis, such belief, such fear. They listened to these three words and rejected them because intellect and logic had no room for spaceships and green-headed things. But the irritation that showed in the eyes and the murmuring and the compressed lips had nothing to do with intellect. A little boy was bringing up fears that shouldn't be brought up. And people on Maple Street this Saturday afternoon were no different from any other set of human beings. Order and reason, logic was slipping away, pushed by the wild conjectures of a 12-year-old boy. Somebody ought to spank that kid! A boy's yelled out from the crowd. Tommy Bishop's voice continued to fight. It pierced the murmurings and rose above them. You might not even get to town. It, it was that way in the story. Nobody could leave. Nobody except... In this next segment, Danger Jim at Rim, you'll witness the ultimate setup and betrayal. At 15, I could stand wanting to get into a real radio station no longer. But everybody said, you have to go to the sticks to break in and get experience. Well, during summer vacation, I decided to hop a Greyhound bus and start my search. 50 miles away from West Palm Beach in Belle Glade, at the local radio station I visited, the guy on the air said, kid, nothing here, but you might check next door in Pahokee. There's a radio station there called WRIM. It's called RIM because it's right on the rim of Lake Okeechobee. Check it out. They might be hiring. And by the way, I admire your determination, kid. I would told him earlier for each radio station that had said no, I would ask two more. And in fact, that was my level of determination. Well, Pahokee was 14 miles away from where I was, with no bus till tomorrow. So I walked to Pahokee. Like I said, this was during summer vacation, and the RIM station manager, Barbara, said in fact that there would be an opening due to a vacation. It was the morning sign-on show, from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., and back from 3 till 7 p.m. sign-off. She had seen my determination. She gave me a chance. 
Pahokee was and is a very small town with a small town square. On the one side there was the radio station. On the other side was a boarding house, very close and convenient. Three things I remember most about WRIM. The first, it was my big break, thanks to Barbara. The second thing I remember, I once overslept after partying with a fellow announcer, Bobby, in West Palm Beach, 50 miles away. We'd gotten in late, like 2 a.m. The next thing I remember was Barbara leaning over my still-sleeping body in the boarding house, asking if I was still working for WRIM. I looked at the clock, 7.30 a.m., my big break, and I'd blown it already. I jumped up, threw on my pants, grabbed my shirt and shoes, and took off for the radio station. As I was hobbling across that town square, I looked over, and there was the local police car with two occupants, watching me hobble, with no shirt on and shoes in hand. I knew I was probably on the verge of being arrested, but alas, I made it to the studio, got the key in the door, and got the station on the air, if not but a little late. She never said another word about that incident. Now, about the setup and betrayal, item three. This, too, involved Barbara, the station manager. Bobby, my fellow radio announcer, was a probably 20 or 21. He'd been working at RIM for some time. And one of the things he would do for kicks would be to turn on the telephone beeper and call girls to talk to and record. To a young man, me, this sounded pretty neat. I listened to a couple of calls, and then he said, Want to try? Sure, I said. Well, Bobby said, Here's a number for you. As I was calling it, he said, And ask for Barbara. And that went right over my head. Hello? Oh, is Barbara there? Who? Barbara. Uh, I can get her to the phone. Let's hold it, please. She go to school or what does she do? She got a job here. What does she do? She's kind of a secretary. <laughs> How old is she? Hello. Uh, is this Barbara? Yes. Uh, do you know who this is? No, I don't. How old are you? Oh, I don't know. Is this uh, happen to be an employee of WRIM? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe not tomorrow. Why? What's uh, the matter? <laughs> uh, uh-oh. I think I just caught it. Hmm? I think I just caught it. Kind of what? Practical joke. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, please. Please? What in the world are you guys doing down there? Don't you think I have no sense to hear a beeper? <laughs> well, uh, Bobby wise dog. <laughs> Not really. Hmm? Bobby gave me a number to call. Let me talk to Bobby. Okay. Bobby's here, but I give him the number. <laughs> what? I said, Bobby's here, but I didn't give him the number. Well, you know, this is not our phone. Well, I know who he was calling up. Huh? I know who he was calling, who he, who he was calling up. Well, so, it's going to be doing this. What in the world you got that beeper on the line for anyway? I didn't know. Jim, did you put that beeper on? I didn't do it. I just probably left from last night. <laughs> what? Well, let me ask you this. What was the beeper doing on the line last night? Bobby? Yes, ma'am. What was the beeper doing on the line? I wasn't here last night. That's unique. Oh, no. <laughs> that was not. <laughs> well, all right. Just, just take it easy, then. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Bye-bye.
As a kid, one of my major challenges was asthma. I had what seemed like to me an attack almost every week. These attacks would usually take one to three days to return to normal. Some would require going to the emergency room at the hospital for a shot of adrenaline. These shots were like little miracles. I could be on death's bed at one moment, but within two or three minutes after the shot, I could feel myself being able to breathe again. The longer the time after the shot, the better I could breathe. And after four or five hours, I was past the asthma. Many times I would go into a sped up state. My creativity was also accelerated. I would be on this creative high for a day, and it would be like a flash of creativity. I found radio and audio production to be an excellent way to vent this energy. I never could tell what started the attacks. Some said weather, some said dust, some said psychosomatic or emotionally triggered. As many attacks as I had, I think perhaps all three were involved. My parents at one point decided to move up the coast from West Palm Beach to Cape Kennedy to see if that might help. My dad did concrete and block construction and worked on building some of the launch pads at the Space Center. He had been driving home to West Palm Beach from Cape Kennedy every weekend. Well, I remember we got there on Saturday and drove around to see the town and the school I would be going to. By Monday, asthma. This case lasted till Friday. It was the worst case I'd had in a long time. The move clearly had not helped. We returned to West Palm Beach. I felt better. They never said we wish it would have worked out. There was no readable reaction from them about it one way or the other. But one of the things I did get out of it was, during the early morning hours, asthma for me was the worst. I could hardly breathe. Moving around was almost impossible. But my ears worked just fine. So I would listen to my portable radio in bed. The further off the station was, the better I liked it. At one point, I ran across this station at 690 on the dial. It would fade in and out, but overall, more in than out. The more I listened, I realized there was no disc jockey, no announcer, no commercials. Then as I listened more closely, I could hear the records being changed automatically with a very crude 45 RPM record changer. Then an announcement that it was Sam Seberg. Seaberg made some of the most beautiful jukeboxes at that time, so they had programmed this baby up to run all night long. I loved it, and one of the songs they played like every hour or two was this, Chord Till 3 by Gary U.S. Bonds. You know, every southern bell is a Mississippi queen, down the Mississippi, down in the water. The station was WTIX, a southern giant in New Orleans. After summer vacation, and having worked a couple of months at WRIM, try as I might to concentrate on other things, the radio bug continued to bite. It was then I saw an ad in the back of an electronics magazine for Mid-South Electronics in Nashville, Tennessee. They had classes in both electronics and announcing. It was thought that maybe additional schooling in radio might make it easier to get in again at another radio station. So at 16, my parents recognized my radio bug addiction, and we drove up to Nashville to check out the school. Mid-South Electronics turned out to be located in an old southern colonial house in the west end of Nashville, not far from Vanderbilt, and just beside the Parthenon. It had two floors, electronics on the top floor and announcing on the first floor, with two living rooms separated by a wall with a large control room window control room operation on one side and student schoolroom setting on the other side with about 25 desks and an office desk in the left front corner for the instructor. There was a loudspeaker with a vintage radio type grill mounted over the studio control room window. Students would operate the audio console and turntables in the control room as in doing a radio show and the rest of the students would listen and critique in the other room. And I think it's just about my turn at the microphone.
From the all new WMSC. WMSC on time. Well, there's about 20 minutes till 11. The Drifters on Radio 1. Save that last dance for me. Every dance with the guy who gives you the island of hope. Sugar bad. If he had. Sugar bad. If you're all alone, can he take you home? You must tell him no. The Drifters on Radio 1. Save that last dance for me. They're here. Yes, they're here at Riddles Motor Company, 5th and Lafayette. The new Hudson for... Now on display at Riddles Motor Company, 5th and Lafayette. You're in tune with the all-new WMSC Nashville. Instant miracle, a great instant miracle. Instant miracle, a great instant miracle. Talk about magic, talk about tricks, you get two big sports. Instant miracle, a wow. Instant miracle, a... Wow. Hey, listen, if you don't uh, drink instant miracle aid, how about drinking milk? You know, everybody needs this health-giving sunshine, vitamin D milk in every meal. Get health-giving sunshine, vitamin D, and Jersey Farms Grade A homogenized vitamin D milk with a rich cream in every single drop. It's nourishing and deliciously fresh in flavor. Get Jersey Farms Grade A homogenized vitamin D milk in cartons or bottles at your grocers. Our phone 64655 for home delivery. That telephone number again now, phone 646. Six, five, five. Carl Perkins up on Radio 1 Tune Decks now. Honey, cause I love ya. This is the all new WMSC and the Jim and the PM show from Radio 1 WMSC. Honey, cause I love ya. Baby, my dreams are about you. This is WMSC Nashville, Tennessee. Rick Nelson says he's got a feeling. Well, I got a feeling. Don and Phil got problems all day long. Let's check in here. Well, I drove a new Ford and I'm a jumping for joy. I tried the new ride and I'm a telling you, boy, it's all new. You love the new kind of Ford. You'll love what you find when you action test a Ford at your Ford dealers and ask about those low Ford prices. Ooh, we got caught there. Here we go now with Johnny Burnett and uh, Ballad of a One-Eyed Jack. The One-Eyed Jack rode to Monterey in the heat of the blazing sun. When Sheriff Lone was so gently old, he stepped on his fast gun. There you have it, Johnny Burnett, one called a One-Eyed Jack, the ballad of said same. Through all your days you'll sing the praise of Pat so tankard Once you taste Old Tankard, you won't forget it. Kathy's clown, Don and Phil, the Everly Brothers. Mid-South Electronics had a very diverse student body. It was VA approved, so some of the students were a lot older. Names now are difficult to recall, but there was an older gentleman there with white hair and kind of like a grandpa type who did have a very good talent for making peach wine. I can recall three or four of us going to the Grand Ole Opry in grandpa's car and drinking the most delicious peach wine. On another occasion, Elvis was to speak at the state capitol. Another student there, a young suave type who drove a Corvette, thought it would be a good idea to use the event as a play remote news coverage training session. So we borrowed the school tape recorder and took off in his Corvette. There were three of us, and it was a two-seater. Guess who got the hump in the middle with the big tape machine? Jim Bergeson, special news reporter for WSMA Radio, covering Elvis Presley, addresses the legislature. People here are most cooperative about letting us set up our recording equipment. There are no outlets here for tape recorders, so we had to disconnect the Coke machine downstairs and plug our tape recorder in downstairs. We have our microphone lead coming up the stairs up until the gallery of the state capitol building and uh, 
If you hear some noises, that's probably me getting pulled down the stairs when somebody gets wrapped up in that microphone cable, which has happened a couple of times already. Time now is about 10 minutes till 11, 10 minutes away from Elvis's appearance. The people in Nashville are very nice people, very hospitable. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but Liddy just uh, said when Elvis came in that uh, she would give us our seats, so maybe we'll sound a little more relaxed if we get down there. At the present, we're balancing ourselves on top of a seat, and uh, just hope we stay up here, because about, eh, about an eight-foot drop down <laughs> it'd be rather bloody. <laughs> Uh, lady just asked us if Elvis was going to sing down there, and uh, it's highly doubtful that he will. <laughs> As he said before, this place is uh, really packed. Many, many people here, along with WSME's recording equipment and WSME's special news event cover, Jim Ferguson. Yours truly, that is. People are standing up on the, the windows, the little window ledges, so they can get a better vantage point of Elvis. As we said before, we were up here uh, perched on the top of a seat trying to get our vantage point. Our cameraman is down below taking film of some of the politicians and delegates coming into the state capitol building. The speaker is slamming on the gavel for order in the room. But the crowd is pretty wild, and uh, here comes our cameraman up here on our precarious perch. She said the Jordanaires were here too, maybe he'll see. The Jordanaires are here also, besides Elvis, so possibly Elvis may do a little vocalizing. It is debatable. And there's Elvis. Just very nicely, it's old Elvis himself. The king. The king as our cameraman just reported. I am pretty sure that the camera that was moved up the center aisle a while ago is the television camera because they're now getting a line on Elvis and are uh, photographing Elvis at the present time. The speaker is now speaking. We'll try to pick up what he is saying. I don't know if you were able to hear what he said. We weren't able to hear either because there was so much noise in the crowd. Tennessee has just been introduced to the speaker's, the speaker's platform. The crowd is supporting very rapidly and very loudly. Elvis has just arrived at the chief clerk's desk and is now speaking to the governor of Tennessee. Somebody's up there rapping on the gavel just for the hang of it, I think. Elvis hasn't said anything at this, uh, at this time. Elvis has just said that, that appearing here at the state capitol building is one of the greatest honors of his whole career. He said that this is one of the nicest things that has ever happened to Elvis. He said he didn't have a speech prepared, and he's not very good at speech making. Here's the crowd breaking into applause once again here at the State Capitol Building in Nashville, Tennessee. This is Jim Ferguson, special news reporter for WSME Radio. I believe somebody just caught a hold of cable again. 
Well, we don't have too much tape left. We all, but we will try to cover his disappearance in the state room, the state capitol room up top. And uh, we're pretty nervous because we're about to use our mic here. And we don't have too much tape left on the tape machine. The traffic is pretty heavy. We can't get up into the gallery at this moment. But uh, we may be able to manage to get up there pretty soon. The gallery has broken, just broken up. Novus is now leaving the top of the room. There he goes. We have to go to the stairs here. There goes Elvis. Out of the state, top of the room, out of the legislative room. Uh, in the midst of four or five state troopers. The people here are thrilled at Elvis. And we are sort of too. The, the state troopers have formed a line with their arms together so that no one can break the line and get into uh, touch Elvis or uh, grab any souvenirs or anything like that. Elvis has now left the Capitol building here in Nashville, Tennessee. You have just heard the on the spot recording of Elvis Presley at the State Capitol building in Nashville, Tennessee. Jim Ferguson, special news reporter for WMSC Radio. Here's love, the following segment is a late add to the list. It was on a tape just recently discovered. Let me just say this about the tapes, mainly the early tapes. I was just a kid with a radio bug addiction. I had no real budget as such to buy new tapes as the old ones were recorded on. So they would be reused, re-recorded on, as needed. Many shows and audio recordings were lost forever, but some survived, even after having been recorded over. I could spend a half hour explaining the technical reasons for this, but let's just say there are sometimes hidden tracks on tape, particularly re-recorded tapes. Some tape heads record differently than others, so you could play a tape and hear one thing, but just ever so close by on another track there was something completely different. Something that had been recorded earlier and didn't get completely erased when it was reused. Many of the earlier recordings in this presentation were found on hidden tracks on the early audio tapes. It takes a special tape machine with special heads to find these hidden tracks. I've gone through hundreds looking for these special hidden tracks, and I thought I'd found them all. But this one was in such bad condition, I'd put it aside for later. Well, later finally got here. This tape took 50 to 60 splices just to be able to play it. Like 30 sections of tape, some playing forward and some backward. Well, it took a while to put it together. Then it took a while longer to fully explore it. That is, play it one way and search the tape for different hidden tracks and then play it the other way and do the same thing. Well, needless to say, most of my earlier tapes have been fully explored by now. So to find something new was truly a treasure. And this one is of special importance because of the germ it planted. One of the techniques I used at WHS Radio was extemporaneous ad-lib comedy vignettes. These were done on the fly. No scripts, not even usually an outline. Just an extemporaneous exploration of humor based on a simple concept tossed out at the beginning. In most of these, I would take the lead as the interviewer so I could lead the unfolding ad-lib in certain directions by the questions I would ask. That's about all the control there was. The rest of the control was in the hands of the humor gods. Well, long story short, this following segment was a hidden track, and it's of myself and my Mid-South instructor, Thurston Springer. We are practice ad-libbing a radio show, almost exactly the same thing I would be doing 10 years later at WHAS. Well, here it is, the ad-lib radio bug, as planted by Thurston Springer in 1960 when I was 16 years old. Thurston speaks first. The year 
1050. That time was one morning just before sunrise on Mars. All of us educated boys from down on Earth had come up here. We were sitting around smoking our cigarette, drinking our, te drinking our tequila, and having ourselves a good time. We sat here for some four hours looking at each other in the eyeball and then suddenly it happened. Hey Joe, put your hands up. I'm gonna shoot you dead. I said, blah, blah, blah. And he shot Joe dead. Then about one hour later, after we buried Joe, we were sitting around again, looking at each other in the eyeball and Listen what happened. Somebody was coughing. <laughs> We didn't plan it that way. Didn't anybody know it was going to be that way, but that's what happened. Somebody was coughing. And about that time, they sneezed. And when they sneezed, <laughs> we forgot about the beans. <laughs> When you know how Mars is, it took about five hours for everything to clear up up there. But once everything kind of settled back down and the eyes quit burning and, and everything seemed like it ought to be just about like it should be, well, I'll let this boy tell you a little bit more about what came to pass. Oh, well, I never had many brains. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's sort of... <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> I, I'm not really stupid, no. <laughs> yeah, just so, so tight. <laughs> but I'll tell you how it happened. <laughs> See, there's this big cow poking town. <laughs> His name is Joe. <laughs> He's a real cool guy. Yeah, that me. Another guy. Yeah, yeah, another guy. And his name was, uh, I don't know what his name was. Well, anyway, it don't make much difference. Anyway. Uh, but they, they, they said that he's going to shoot him dead. He's going, uh, uh, shoot him dead. Yeah, I'm going to shoot him dead. <laughs> I'd have never believed it. <laughs> then that gun bullet, <laughs> right to his head. <laughs> Funny guy. Well, that's about the way it happened up there. And dear friends and neighbors, I'm a sitting here writing this letter in Martian. And that ain't easy to do, seeing as how I am a Republican. Well, I was, I was his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, my name is Susie. <laughs> Uh, you missed me on the first tape. My name's Susie. You know, Susie? S-U-E-Z-Y. Susie? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was Joe's boyfriend. Uh, no, I have a girlfriend. You know, I get mixed up. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, they shot him. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, now, yeah. that's what I said. Uh, he shot him. He shot him dead. Well, I don't know how Joe got out again, but uh, that's the way it happened. Everybody got shot dead. And you know the funny part? Nobody had any guns. <laughs> it's real strange up there on Mars. Strange things happen all the time and every day. You have been listening to a program over the ABC network entitled Who Shot Liz? ABC Radio Network invites you to listen again next week at the same time for Who Shot Liz? And all of it came your way underwater. WMSC 1950 on your radio dial. And now, here with the commentary for today with our news wrap-up for the evening is Mr. Jim F. 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 Flanagan.
This is David Huntley with the latest news from around the world across the nation and in the Mid-South. Uh, well, President Kennedy today said that uh, he was thinking very seriously of pursuing me of, of Jacqueline. Now, that means that in the near future, Jacqueline will not be allowed to attend as any of the vice president. Now, also, Mr. Kennedy today issued another ultimatum to the Lucian government. He said, there shall never be no more yes, sir. In the meantime, this is David Brinkley coming your way with a special news bulletin. Dogwood growers, begin controlling your dogwood. This is the advice of Root Mullet, a University of Tennessee Extension entomologist. He's controlled with a water-based insecticide sprayed or painted on the trunks of dogwoods. He didn't say anything about the stumps that were split. Mullet says the ore is a limiting factor in the growth of the dogwood tree, but he says that it is not a limiting factor in the growth of the population. <laughs> the adult worm is a small, uh, clear, uh, well, it resembles, uh, well, it ha uh, it's nice. <laughs> and now, once again, back to Huntley. Once again, this is David Thuntley in Washington. We have a special report just in from the jungle. Yes, the jungle. Jungle doctor uh, Tom Hooley is dead. Yes, jungle doctor Tom Dooley is head. Rip. Yes, he's been head. Rip. Rip head. R.I.P. Yes. P.R. Yes, rip head. Now we take you back to who is it? I don't know, but I'm here. A young Canadian kidnap victim has been found. Uh, he never was lost, but they wanted you to know that he had been found in case you thought that he had been lost. And we have a special message for a lady that listens to our program each and every night. She writes saying, I wish you would get your program up, excuse me, wrong letter. Uh, it says here, I listen to your uh, program every evening. And I think it is the most wonderful, the most glorious newscast that I have ever heard day in and day out, night in and night out, signed Mrs. David Huntley. Now back to David. Yes, I had to get my wife in that. How do you like our friend mail there, uh, uh, whoever you are? Uh, yes, just fine, just fine. Uh, you never did introduce yourself properly to our radio audience out there and uh, to quote a phrase, Radio Land? Well, David, we have been friends for so long, I thought you recognized me and knew my name was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, uh, friends and neighbors out there in Radio Land. If, uh, you can remember my name, uh, would you please drop me a card or a letter? I seem to have misplaced it somewhere. I say there. Oh, jolly, jolly good, if I do say so. Quite right there, old chap, quite right. And let's what say, let's go out and have a little, uh, a little, uh, go down to the pub and have a, well, let's have one anyway. Oh, I think that is a bloody good idea, a bloody good idea, old chap. Oh, bloody chap, oh, bloody, bloody, bloody. Yes, sir. And gooey too, you know, old chap. Gooey, 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 to do too, 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 Until uh, tomorrow evening at the same time, this is uh, David uh, Brinkley and uh, Chet Huntley wishing you and yours from the BBC a most glorious good afternoon, uh, bloody chaps all. Big John. Big Bad John. WENO Radio at the time was the only radio station playing only country music in the country music capital of the world. My instructor, Thurston Springer, known on the radio as Country Cuz, was working weekends at Reno, and he had gotten me a job there running the control board when the other personalities were broadcasting live from remote locations. In addition to switching back and forth and playing all the commercials, it included reading the news. And remember, that free gift for every youngster in the family, a handsome book satchel, absolutely free. That's the Park Plaza Pancake Palace, 920 Murfreesboro Road. Time now for the 5.30 news headlines. First of all, the Defense Department is calling up more than 76,000 reservists. East German police fired tear gas bombs into a crowd of West Berliners on the border today. 
The president of Brazil has resigned from office, saying he has been frustrated in his efforts to run the government. And the final item, President Kennedy is spending the weekend at Cape Cod. Turning now to the weather, weather forecast for Nashville and Middle Tennessee, mostly cloudy and mild with scattered areas of rain and a few thunder showers this afternoon. And uh, high this afternoon, 75 to 83. Low tonight, 62 to 70. High scheduled for Saturday, 78 to 85. With all of for Sunday, calls for little change. Present temperature on the ever watch for we know weather chart now stands at 83 degrees. Humidity, 58%. Barometric pressure, 29.33 and steady. The winds are the west-northwest at 5 miles per hour. The sky is partly cloudy. Visibility, 15 miles. That's the news and weather together from we know's Universal Newsroom. They're in the bag. What's in the bag? Delicious golden sunbeam buns. Buy sunbeam buns. They keep fresh longer. Sunbeam, the favorite. Buy fresh sunbeam buns. This is Greater Nashville's fastest growing station. This is Weno, WENO, W-E-N-O, 1430 on your radio, with studios and transmitters on the beautiful Weno Ranch in suburban Madison, Tennessee. On we go with the Happy Time Show. Here's Don. Hi, and welcome back now to the Fender Bender from B.F. Myers and Son Furniture and Appliance Company here in Gillisville, Tennessee. Here's Jimmy Newman and Big Mamu. And follow the signs. We'll be right back after the news and weather together from Weno. Ten fabulous prizes the whole family will enjoy. Win a Chevrolet Corvair in the big RC Family Fun Contest. Enter the RC Family Fun Contest today. You're in tune with Greater Nashville's fastest growing station. This is Weno, W-E-N-O, 1430 on your radio. Fuels and transmitters on the beautiful Weno Ranch in Madison, Tennessee. Time now for the 130 News headlines. First of all, a bulletin. Roger Maris has hit his 49th home run of the season against the Cleveland Indians. Maris connected for his homer in the third inning after teammate Mickey Mantle hit number 46 in the first inning. Elsewhere around the world across the nation, Vice President Johnson was waiting in West Berlin today as 1,500 American troops moved into the Communist Ring City. The U.S. reinforcements made their way through East Germany into West Berlin without an incident. President Kennedy is at a summer home in Ionisport, Massachusetts after being kept informed throughout the night on the progress of the U.S. troops bound for Berlin. Mr. Kennedy returns to Washington Tuesday. And a final item, Secretary of Commerce Luther Hodges says the Berlin crisis has nearly eliminated all chances for any cut in federal taxes. Turning now to the weather, the weather forecast for Nashville of Middle Tennessee, partly cloudy and continued warm today with only a chance of afternoon and evening thunder showers. High scheduled for today, 84 to 92. Fair and cool tonight. The low temperatures, 56 to 62. And the weather outlook for Monday, sunny. Present temperature on the Everwatch for Wino weather chart now stands at 79 degrees. Humidity 74%. Barometric pressure 29.35 and falling. The winds are out the northwest at 13 miles per hour. The sky's cloudy. Visibility 10 miles. That's the news and weather together from Wino's Universal Newsroom. You're in tune with Greater Nashville's fastest growing station. This is Wino, WVNO. 1430 on your radio dial with studios and transmitters on the beautiful Wheeler Ranch in suburban Madison, Tennessee. On we go now with the weekend show. Here's Country Cuz. All right, we're going to ping pong it right over there to Brook Mountain. All of it coming your way from Pleasant Hills this afternoon. We'll be telling you all about it as we go. Good evening. It just got there. Let me tell you a story about a bold wheel. I'm a traveling man made a lot of stops over the world. We Know Radio was a real learning experience, mostly about having a sense of humor. There are just some experiences that get stamped in your brain. Embarrassment is one of those experiences. It just so happened when I was working part-time at We Know that there was a major Tennessee state prison riot. Being young and part-time, I thought this might be my big chance to establish my credibility in the news area. So I drove to the prison. I had no difficulty mingling with all the reporters present. I mostly stayed by the pay phones, listening to all the reporters call in with their stories. After five or six reporters phoned in with their feeds, it would be my turn, and I just cloned the best parts from each report I'd heard. It worked really well. My confidence level grew with each report I filed. I was going live and it was great. After four or five reports, I was the man on scene and I'd ask that each of my phone reports be recorded. Well, the riot finally ended. I'd been there for eight hours. I was tired, but I wanted a strong, dramatic close. So at the end of my last report, I signed off with, 
And so, it's over. The coffee and sandwich machines are empty, and it's over. There was a slight pause, and then I heard a voice coming back down the telephone line. It said, Well, Jim, I'm sure if you wait around, they'll fill them shortly. I think the moral of the story is be very careful with the dramatics, because you just might run across a person with a sense of humor. And speaking of a sense of humor, there was one other moment of embarrassment at Wino. My main job was to run the mixer board when they were doing remote broadcasts, which they did a lot of. From time to time, I would have to record commercials on the B channel of the board when they were playing records from the remote van. Well, it just so happened that they brought me this copy to record as soon as I could. And the copy was long, way too many words, but it would be a big hassle for them to redo it, so I would just have to go as fast as I could. The client was Shoe City. Well, I hit the remote control button to put the Ampex tape machine into the record mode. It was rack-mounted in the meter room in the hallway outside. I looked to make sure it was rolling. I flipped the mic key on, and I was supposed to say, Shoe City Shoes. But it didn't come out that way. In a moment, I knew it was a bust, so I stopped. I went to turn the mic key off, but when I touched it, I realized it was in the A for air position, not the B position it was supposed to be in. And that's when I froze. The chief engineer happened to be in the meter room at the time and heard it. Meanwhile, a red heat was rising through my body towards my face. The chief had to come in and turn my mic off. He left the control room shaking his head. I think the moral to this story is, you have to keep a sense of humor. All I can say about this next segment is sometimes reverb and echo effects can lead one, shall we say, astray. The effect becomes bigger than life. You become the superstar. Listen to the effect of the effect. <clears throat> Time now for the latest news. I understand Massachusetts. President Kennedy says he will ask Congress for power to build up U.S. military might over a long-range period. Grand Rapids, Grand Michigan. Rapids, Michigan. Michigan. Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Michigan. 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 Republican uh, National Chairman William Miller says President Kennedy has uh, mishandled U.S. foreign policy. Miller, Miller. a performance has interrupt. <clears throat> Here are the headlines. Astronaut, Astronaut. Grissom, Grissom. Grissom. France. France. France, former, former. former. Cape Canaveral, Cape Canaveral, Cape Canaveral. Space writer Virgil Grissom says uh, seeing the hatch cover fly off his capsule yesterday was his biggest surprise of the day. The Cuban Minister of Transport issued an order to an American to confine its Cuban activities to its regularly scheduled flights of two days, two flights a day. An extra flight was en route to Cuba when the order was issued and was diverted back to Miami via radio. This is if anyone should ask, this is WENO, We Know Radio, 1430 on your radio dial. <coughs> this is the microphone, here. Uh... from the Ozarks. Yes, I'm from, I'm old Grandpa Willie back here in the old jungle. You know, many years ago, I was working on the railroad. Yes, I was one of the ties. I was one of the biggest ties in the world. And then, well, since they kicked me out, they said, well, they said, 
I was too old to work on the railroad anymore. Do you know what happens when a person becomes too old to work on the railroad? Well, I don't know. I wonder what happens when someone becomes too old to work on the railroad. Well, I'll tell you. When you become too old to work on the railroad, they ship you out south. And they say, dig that ditch. I didn't know. Tell me more about it, sir. Well, there's not much left to tell. I'm getting pretty old for my age. Just how old are you? Oh, well, I'm between 8 and 9 and 95. Between 8 and 9 and 95, huh? Yeah, that's right, between 85 and 92. I think you're changing your age. I'm not neither, I'm just an old man. You look old. Oh, yes, I'm the great pretender. The Platters, The Great Pretender, a big hit for them in 1955. But this is 1961, how does that work? Well, listen, and I'll tell you in this commentary. While I did work at Wino Radio, at the time the only country music station in the country music capital of the world, it was only in a basic board operator slash junior announcer capacity. If need be, I knew I could be replaced within five minutes by any number of a hundred other fellow radio bug kids. So I felt simply overwhelmed when I was invited to the station party at the home of the station general manager, high in the hills overlooking Nashville. The roads curve around up there. You don't see many of the palatial homes from the main road. You mainly look for the house numbers on the mailboxes. There are no names on the boxes, just numbers. I found the right number, and there were quite a few cars parked along either side of the road in that area. I parked where I could and started walking down the long paved driveway. It kind of meandered along, and when I was still a long way from the main house, I could hear music lofting through the air. As I got closer, I realized what the music was. The platters and their hit, The Great Pretender. I thought to myself, this must be some kind of mistake. The wrong house and the wrong party. I mean, this was a country music radio station party with the cream of country music disc jockeys. Would they be playing the platters? Well, apprehensively, I continued to approach what turned out to be an almost palace-like setting. It was the right place, the right party, and I had a great evening, schmusing with all the bigwigs and station employees. But the main revelation I had that night was that these people don't eat and sleep country music. They're professionals doing a job. Their personal lives might be quite different. This revelation broadened my outlook on life in general, and also broadened my professional outlook. It was another instructional moment along the highway of life. But I wondered about that tune I heard coming up to the party house that night. Because it was, in fact, the great pretender. Pretending that you're still alive. After graduating from Mid-South Electronic School, and knowing that working at Wino Radio would probably remain part-time indefinitely, I came back to West Palm Beach and began applying at all the local stations. And finally, persistence paid off. Has anybody seen a tiger? Hi, Jim Ferguson here, inviting you to join me on the Jim Ferguson Noon to Three Spree, and again from 5 until 7 on the WHEW Drive Home Safely Show. Sure would like to have you, because we're going to have a ball in the hall, y'all, and that's what you call Southern Draw. See ya. Stand by East Coast Florida, from WATW, the home of the good guys, it's the Jim Ferguson Show. Hi, Jim. Don't be nervous. Don't be rocky. You're a teenage jockey now. I got burned. I got burned. A lot of the past directed to it. Peanuts. Peanuts. 
Time to spread the news, Swinger. Have no fear, though. We'll be waiting on the flip of the news with a stick of dynamite. This is WHEW 1600 Golden Record Radio in Riviera Beach. Eastern Standard Time, 7.30. As the Telsar satellite circles the world, WHEW news reporters circle the earth to bring you WHEW headline news. The Pentagon has revealed an overflight of the American aircraft carrier Constellation by four Russian planes. President Kennedy is in Costa Rica with heads of six Central American republics to talk over hemispheric problems. James Hoffa of the Teamsters Union has charged the labor movement in America is facing a great crisis. Revised street level temperature for the metropolitan Palm Beaches, 80, that's 80 degrees. Radio 160 headline news. No sooner done than said. And with the big explosion, we're off and running on sound stage number three of the Gemini PM Big Sound Survey. On well, this March the 18th of Monday, let's go 20 miles with that Chevy Checker type guy. Reducing plan. The number eight sound on the fabulous 50 of WHEW at 35 minutes past the hour of seven. The weather for the Metropolitan Palm Beach is fair and continued warm through Tuesday. High in the mid 80s, low 70 to 73, mostly southeasterly winds, 8 to 50 miles per hour. And if you happen to be down by the station early in the morning, you can hear the Jack Triplett show about 6 a.m. That's pretty early in the morning, but it's worth it because he's a swinging guy. Here's today's health tip from the American Medical Association. Sleep is important to health. And if you find that sleeping two or three hours longer during a 24-hour period makes you feel more refreshed, it might be that you are habitually depriving yourself of sleep. So you test your sleep needs next weekend. Magic to ride and live by the sea. The story of a fag and dragon, Puff, is to meet a Joe. She says even if he does smoke, keep your hands off of him. 18 minutes in front of a fun video time. Take your hands off of him. He's got you to. From out of the past, to meet a Joe. He's mine, oh mine, oh man, oh what you do. Other Joe to be a big sound survey show. Take your hands off of him. Mark that time, 16 in front of eight. This is Richard Chamberlain. I'd like to talk to you about the proud position of officer in the United States Navy. Navy OCS represents one of the most important steps a college graduate can take toward a career dedicated to serving our country. Ask your Navy recruiter how you can become a part of our American heritage by serving as an officer in our mighty Navy. From the pick album of the week, this is Lawrence Welk, Walk Right In. Revised street level temperature for the Metropolitan Palm Beach is standing at 80, that's 80 degrees. <laughs> Little Peggy March now, no matter where he goes, I'll follow him. On this March 18th, the money type gym be spectacular. Currently number 41 on the fabulous 50 at WHEW, I will follow him. Stand by for Buddy Holly and Peggy Sue. If you knew On this Jim and the P.M. March 18th, Monday time, spectacular, it's nine minutes in front of eight. When those oldies play, we listen. Those are the diamonds wailing there. With a real gem of a record, it's called Diamonds. 
And it wraps up sound stage number four at the WPM Big Sound Survey for this March the 18th, Monday time. Hope it's not blue. Stand by at the top of the hour for this golden hit parader. From the top of your dial, 1600 radio. The top of the new. At 7.55, these news stories are on the move. Tallahassee. Florida's prison system reported today a net decline in inmate population during the past month of 13 prisoners. The prison division said that inmate population is now 7,685 compared to 7,698 last month. Cape Canaveral. A British rocket expert said today that Great Britain plans to launch its first Blue Streak space rocket from Australia next year. Robert Hum of the de Havilland Company that built the Blue Streak said the initial shot will be a suborbital shot over a 1,250 mile... This week, rating a big number 41 on the Fabulous 50. And you might be young and in love, but you better be safety smart. Mm -hmm. Use your head to protect your whole body. The National Safety Council says be careful on the way to and from school. Obey traffic lights, traffic policemen, and traffic signs. Your school safety patrols are there to keep you from getting hurt in traffic, so obey them too. And remember, safety smart kids have more fun and fewer accidents. So if you're young and in love, be smart, huh? And watch out, because it could be dangerous. I know, says Tommy Rowe. You're cute. Oh, no, not again. And actually, that's not Tommy Rowe. That's Tommy Mano. They rhyme, though, don't they, huh? On Fun Radio? Forget it. The news, the news, electronic news from the north, south, east, and the west. On WHDW, from our action central, news is a media flash. Extra electronic news. See your Marine recruiter and convince him you can qualify. The Marine Corps builds me. I was going to join the Marine Corps one time, but they didn't build me a man. They built me a nut. Here we go, Steve Allen, the pick album of the week. It's Whistle Bait. <laughs> That's Steve Allen and uh, the pick album of the week, and that one was entitled Whistle Bait. And then there was a time I was going to join the Navy, but they found out I couldn't float. <laughs> so they canceled that. Here's Elliot Ness in his mess. By combining the varied talents and skill of thousands of men into a unified power, the United States Navy preserves our country's freedom. There's going to be a big sound survey at seven minutes past ten. Bob B. Socks is sing for you on this March the 28th with 68 degrees revised street level temperature, and it's tagged. In this next segment of The Commercials, as you listen, you might notice a couple of familiar spot themes, which brings up an important observation. When you move from one area to another, all of the earlier spots you did can be redone in the new market because they will not have been heard. That's why it's important to keep a personal master production reel of your very own. Why reinvent the wheel? <clears throat> we interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. In a matter of 30 seconds, the first one-man moon expedition will go roaring off launch pad A here at the Cape. But first, as per usual, the United States astronauts' national theme. Hi! Cross. Ten seconds till firing time. Mark. Colonel, do you have a final word for our listening audience? Great! Go, 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 go! Let me out of here! Fiverr. Four. Three. Two. One. Hello, Fiverr. Hello, 
This is Colonel Clark Kappa going to base. Must return to Earth. Must return to Earth. Forgot my Van Lam sweater from Belk's department store. Shop at Belk's today. We are not going to interrupt this record. <laughs> Yes, we are. Jim Ferguson, Special News, Cape Canaveral. We understand Mercury Control was in direct radio contact with astronaut Clarence on the moon. We asked them how the transmission arrived here at that distance. They replied, On the wings of the snow, white dove. Calling Cape Canaveral. Calling Cape Canaveral. This is Colonel Clarence Capricorn. Do you receive? Over. This is Cape Canaveral. Go ahead, Colonel Capricorn. This is Capricorn, back to Canaveral. Boys, you'll never believe this, but even the moon has a box department store. This is Canaveral, back to Capricorn. What part of the moon are you on, anyway? 305 Clematis, and my radar scope says... Shop at Belk's today! Hi, this is Huey on Radio Hugh. I just got by to remind you to listen to the Jim Ferguson Blast from the Past. That's the Jim Ferguson Blast from the Past on Radio Hugh, W-H-E-W. <laughs> Radio jingles are a mainstay of the broadcast industry. For me, the making of jingles began early. The first two I ever produced were WHEW Radio when I was 18. But I had dreamed of recording radio jingles and such a lot earlier. I can recall as a kid, there was a large chicken coop at the end of Dillman Road, about a half mile from my house. It was like a small house set apart from everything else. And I just dreamed of what a fine recording studio it would make. Of course, you would have to lose the chickens and spend a month or so mopping it up to get rid of the... Well, you know what I mean. Chicken Coop Productions. Well, that never happened. It was just a kid's dream. But in fact, a few years later, part of that dream did come true. Here are the first two jingles I ever recorded. They were for WHEW Radio and recorded in the production room. Like I said earlier, advancement in money and stature in radio does not usually occur within the station, but more often moving from one station to another. WJNO in West Palm Beach was an older established MOR station with classy studios right on the Inland Waterway in downtown West Palm Beach. I had auditioned there before I got the job at WHEW. That audition was one of the scariest. You walk in, and the much older, very curt program manager gives you some AP news stories and a couple of commercial scripts. He leads you into an unbelievably cold studio, to a podium. He adjusts the mic, moves to the audio board, looks back to you, and points. Meanwhile, you are shivering, actually physically shivering. You try to cover this effect so it's not heard in your voice as you begin. Well, it must not have gone too badly, for they did call back a year later with a job offer that included more money. I have to clarify that. Uh, nothing really happened. Uh, I made mincemeat out of both those semis. Good music, more fun. It's the swinging one. WJNO 1230. 
79 degrees in the Palm Beaches, Papa Jim, with you. From now until midnight, we invite you to come along. On the WJO Night Beach show, that's the sound of the Greenwood Singers and the Eagle and Me and a TikTok which says it's 14 and one half beyond the hour of 10. All uh, kidding aside, if you're driving on the city streets, highways or byways, do watch those driveways and watch out for those uh, children's balls that come rolling out in the streets because <laughs> they're actually government surplus landmines. <laughs> Sun, fire, rain, sleep, need, snow, let's go! 1230 WJNO presents the weather. Gonna rain? Tell you today. Gonna be with you all the way. First from each weather line. From the ever cognizant WJNO weather eye, meteorologically for the Palm Beach area skies, it'll be partly, wow, partly cloudy with widely scattered showers through Monday. 5 to 15 mile per hour east to southeasterly winds becoming more southeasterly in direction on Monday. Our shower probability 20%. Currently in the Palm Beaches, we have 79 degrees. And right now we give you the old standby. Standby, in crowd, cut three. WJO Radio has complete recording facilities. This is great news for all combo groups. For only $155, you receive a complete recording package consisting of up to a three-hour recording session and 300 top-quality 45 RPM recordings on your own label for the phenomenally low price of just $155. Complete! Don't pay more. Only $155 for a complete recording session. Call WJO Radio at Temple 23638 for complete details. All righty, Papa Jim with you, and we have music from now until the top of the hour of midnight, at which time we'll have total information news, but between now and then we give you... More music, more of it. All the love in the world. Connie Francis with a sure shot sound from 12 3 radio 19 beyond 10 we have 11 minutes before the hour of 10 uh, 30 if you call 10 30 an hour it is a portion of an hour but anyway at 10 30 total information news headlines and weather await you all right push button one nothing happens number two nothing happens number three is the ejection button this is WJNO Radio, the station the Palm Beaches listen to first. You're no exception to the rule. Seventy-nine degrees outside. Here's Jimmy Settler, Moonlight Madonna. Great sound of Moonlight Madonna on the WJO Night Beat Show at twenty-two minutes beyond ten. All righty, 79 degrees outside, a little trouble here. Vic Dana, <laughs> well, actually, you see, it's a brand new record. It's never been played before, and uh, it's been untouched by human hands. A couple of disc jockeys, but untouched by human hands. Uh, 22 minutes beyond the hour of 10, and we try it again. Here's Vic Dana and the sound of distant drums. Yes, I hear them coming now. The sound of On the night beat show, at long last, the sound of Vic Dana and distant drums. <laughs> Let's drum him out of the core. Talking about our engineer. This is WJNO. We're due to our ingenious engineer. We're on the air 24 hours a day. Stand back, it's going to blow. You know what he did to me? He really messed me up. He gave me a left-handed turntable. I'm right-handed. Makes it difficult. Very difficult to give you... More music, more often. Put another nickel in, in the Nickelodeon. And music, music. That's Tazzy Brewer on the WJ Night Beat Show. Sounds of music, 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 courtesy of 1230. WJNO. 
12.30 In the Palm Beaches Yeah, that's almost what I said. I think we'll start a new ritual on the WJO Night Beat Show. Every time you hear a complete tune on the Night Beat Show, you'll dump a nickel in your loudspeaker. At the end of the week, I'll come around and collect it all. Good friends, it's about time for us to cut out for three minutes of late news headlines and the weather. Be back on the flip side with more music from Channel 1230. Just remember about those radios. Keep putting your money in. And if you run out of change, remember, I'll trust you. You can wait and hear about, uh, well, let's see, 20 records and then dump in a dollar bill, you know. Pause for three on WJO Radio 1230 West Palm Beach. It's 1030 p.m. WJNO, the essential news. WJO's Action News Central. Here are the latest news headlines. President Johnson, in a speech before a national conference on crime, said poverty must be eliminated before crime can be eradicated. Soviet officials have rejected United States overtures to better relations. The bill creating a new Department of Transportation has been signed into law. And a total of 531 United States planes have been lost in the Vietnamese conflict since 1964. From WJO's Weather Eye, it'll be partly cloudy with widely scattered showers through Monday. 5 to 15 mile per hour east to southeasterly winds, becoming more southeasterly in direction on Monday. The shower probability, 20%. Our low this evening predicted 75, high forecast tomorrow, 85, and the low tomorrow evening once again, 75. Currently in the Palm Beaches, we have 7-9, that's 79 degrees, humidity 69%, wind easterly at present at 12 miles per hour, barometric pressure 30.01, and steady. Next news on WJO. A complete newscast at the top of the hour of 11. Bulletins broadcast at once. Hey, hang on. 32 minutes beyond 10. Papa Jim with you on WJO's Night Beat Show. This record may appear scratched, and if uh, that is the case with you, you're right, absolutely, it is scratched. We play it uh, every once in a while to ensure people that uh, they're not the only one that have scratched records. Makes them feel better, you know. And after all, that's what we're here for. Please lock me away And don't allow the day Here inside Where I hide With my loneliness I don't care what they say I won't stay in a world without love I always had a fancy to document things in audio. So when a hurricane was bearing down on us in West Palm Beach, I was there, trusty Mike in hand, doing the blow-by-blow blow, as it were. Maybe we could use some of it for radio. It was early morning and the hurricane was tracking right for us. It was just a couple of hours away. And as I remember now, I spent the eye of that hurricane in a telephone booth praying to be rescued by the highway patrol. And needless to say, it became very interesting. There's a gust of about 75. And I don't think that TV antenna is for much longer. And the wind, the, the wind is blowing the rain so hard that it almost looked like it's snowing. It's tremendous, tremendous, tremendous gust of wind. From what I can see, though, uh, uh, on looking around, there has been no, no damage uh, to speak of, except for my dipole antenna, which didn't quite make the scene, but uh, that's neither here nor yonder. This wind is coming across in tremendous gusts, and it's wet, very, very wet and cold, too. We're going to suspend this, um, this recording session since uh, 7.30. We've been recording. The recording before that was uh, taken at 6.30. We're going to suspend this. There was another, before I could get away, there was a tremendous bust, burst of wind. And uh, what it looks like, 
my, there's a limb broken down off a tree uh, out here in the front of the house. And as I look at it, my long line antenna is, is, is bent in a U form. And if it snaps up by the tree, it's gonna throw that, another tremendous burst of wind. Well, I never was able to make that final test because shortly after that time, the power went off and uh, that sort of KO'd the recorder and uh, amplifier power also. The damage uh, in the Metropolitan Palm Beaches was uh, uh, pretty extensive, uh, the, but the greatest damage was to trailers. I left, after the power went off at the house, I left the house. I started towards the station, but uh, I never made it. I ran out of gas, and I went through Hurricane Cleo uh, in a telephone booth, and uh, one of the, I went through the eye of the hurricane in the telephone booth. The other eye, other side of the eye started coming back, and a highway patrol car came up, which my wife had phoned, and oddly enough, it was Sergeant Tom, who was... Uh, very likable man, public relations man for the Florida Highway Patrol. And we spent uh, about two hours together riding around the Metropolitan Palm Beaches. Uh, he was checking on uh, how his men's homes came through Hurricane Cleo and reporting to his dispatcher. And his dispatcher relayed the messages to his men who are on patrol. Uh, the trailers, many trailers over on... Uh, Canal Road were damaged quite badly. Some were overturned. Some of the trailers just looked like they had exploded. There was just a bunch of rubble where the uh, trailer once stood. Uh, plate glass windows in gas stations and in town were just busted in. Two of them in Belks. The uh, Sears store had boarded up the bottom part of their store, but it left the top windows unboarded, and all of those were were busted out. WJNO at that time switched over to their emergency auxiliary power supply, and we were on the only station on the air from 8.30 a.m. until the power was restored at uh, 3, uh, about 10 minutes past the hour of 3 uh, p.m. the following well, actually, that day, the power was restored to WJNO, and then later it was restored to the other stations around town. Uh, as I say, the uh, damage was pretty bad here in the Metropolitan Palm Beaches. Riding around with Sergeant Tom, we saw many uh, trees across power lines, uh, across the roads, and if at all possible, I'm going to try to have uh, what I had recorded uh, on my way to work, I'm going to try to dub that onto this tape at this time, too. So if you'll stand by. The eye of the hurricane is presently passing over, and um, we are going down Dillman Road, out west of town. Uh, we have not seen any damage thus far, mainly uh, limbs in the front of the houses. Impassable. We'll have to turn around and try 
And that's the way it looked, August the 27th, 1964. We spent uh, the um, eye of the hurricane and ha half of the other side in a telephone booth of Southern Boulevard at the Ace Hardware store. And uh, halfway through the other side of the hurricane, Sergeant Tom of the Highway Patrol came by, which my wife uh, had phoned, and uh, we spent uh, two hours together riding around the... Uh, outlying areas of the metropolitan Palm Beaches, uh, surveying the damage, which was quite extensive, mainly to uh, trailers, as I had mentioned before, uh, and blown uh, windows from uh, gasoline uh, stores, gasoline stations, and uh, uh, other uh, establishments around the town. And that was Hurricane Cleo, August the 27th, 1964. At WJNO, my main job was the air shift between 7 and midnight, known as the Night Beat Show. This show is mainly MOR classic music hits, many in the form of the original 78 RPM records. I always hope to broaden this show's program content. Here's a demo I created to show another concept, featuring many of my original poems, as well as some others. I hope to do this segment later in the evening, between 11 p.m. and midnight. I'd heard a late-night radio broadcast a few times out of Chicago from WGN Radio with Franklin McCormick, where poetry was featured, and I thought it was a strong concept. Some jocks never listen to their competition. I always did. I felt like the more you take in, the more you grow, and that's what life's all about, experiences. I called this show concept The Sounds of the Night. Again.
Good evening to you, and welcome in to the sounds of the night. The sounds of the night, the softer sounds. Good evening to you, Sleeping Beauty, and hi to you, old buddy. Nice to see you on the sounds of the night. Let us go. The torch is lit. Tonight, my love, tonight I say goodbye. Goodbye to all our needs and hopes and dreams. Farewell to all our plans, our lives and tears. Farewell, my love, as my heart breaks in two, it seems. We've loved, we've loved as only two of a kind can. Through good and bad, we've always pulled as one. How does one leave one that's loved when he knows for him another there is none? No one else can make me feel the way you do for no one else would my heart break in two for things that have to be then be it but this my love did not for this was up to you goodbye my love goodbye my love and goodbye my heart too The teacher of logic said reason. The poet said passion. Without logic we muddle and fail, said the teacher of reason. The poet said fiddle. What about nature? Has nature no plan, you poor fuddled creature? You're a rational man, not an ape or an angel. The poet said nonsense. I'm an angel, an ape, and a creature of sense. Not a brain in a box that a head shrinker with logic unlocks. I'm total. I'm human. It's you who are not. You sound like a woman. The poet said, rot. You're just a machine. You can't write a poem, and you can't make a dream. But the logical man said, I'll stick to my reason. He said it with passion. My love, my love, my lovely love, you are a sight to see. My love, my love, my lovely love, my heart to speak to thee. With all the words from all the worlds, my heart is filled for wondrous you, hotter than the burning fire, and softer than the morning dew. And you, my love, my lovely love, you're fairer than that golden moon. Yes, fairer than that golden moon and brighter than the sun at noon. Take my hand, my love, and let us walk the deck. No need to worry of the rolling waves, for we shall never wreck. In the beginning, my love, there were three. Adam, Eve, and the sea. And even now, there remains three. You, I, and the sea. We sail by sunlight, and dine by twilight, love by moonlight, and sleep by starlight. We do all these as though we're one. For inside of each, we are as one. Look, my love, at the ribbon of moonlight dancing upon the sea. Now, my love, look into my eyes and tell me what you see. You must see love, for I feel so much that it hurts to know that you, my dear, might see my love as such. But every time you look at me, 
I thank God I do love. For without love, man is less than man, for man was meant to love. So with all the words from all the worlds, my heart to speak to thee, but from all the words of all the worlds, my heart needs only three. Only three little words to say to let my lovers see. Only three small words to speak to say I love thee. Once upon a summer's night, when hearts were young and full of dare, I met a girl from Tompkinsville, whose hair was long and filled the air. We talked some time of this and that, just her and I alone. And as we talked, I watched her eyes, for that's where love is shown. Her reddened lips continued to move, but not a sound I heard, and I remember thinking, now really, this is absurd. For I'd never met another being that spoke with her eyes as she, and I remember thinking, she must be the one for me. And after a while, I began to feel as though I'd known her all my life, as though she'd been inside of me through good and bad, pain and strife. Her eyes were not of that of man, but of another world, and as two doomed ships that fight the storm, together our lives were hurled. But then I was very young, and wished that I were old, and there are but two that have not time, the very young and the very old. And now that I am old, I wish that I were young, for I found that there are many women and many songs yet to be sung. But be that as it may, I've still looked and saw and seen Yes, thank God I've lived, and now I'm 17. Cold and wanting was the endless night, time that knew no bound, a world shadowed from the faintest light like a sealed tomb without a sound. And a driving torrent of rain gushed from this blackened shield, mixing with a misty fog that had settled on the field. The golden moon had run, or maybe just was hiding, or could have been there still, but no longer was it guiding. No longer could I view it, high up in the sky, peering down on the whole wide world with its understanding eye. For you see, a friend for life was fighting her final fight. Yes, my young and beautiful wife was passing on tonight. And here I was, watching as she dies, and rain mixed with burning tears trinkled from my cold blue eyes. You know, it's funny how you feel when you lose the closest friend. You know your heart is broken, that it can never mend. And that's the way I felt now, staring up into the black, knowing something was going something I'd always lack. For no matter what you've done, 
Or better, what's been done to you? There must be someone to talk with. And for me, there were two. My soft young Anne had been the first. And she had brought a friend. And I had come to love them both with a love that should never end. But strange he was, our friend of friends, for he would never come in day, but only at daylight's end. And he'd start the night so weak, we'd think he'd surely fall. But by the stroke of midnight, he'd be the tallest one of all. Yes, the golden moon, the traveler of the sky, the one that saw of many things from his lofty perch a high. But then the look on my Annie's face told me that both were gone. My pale young Annie from my arms and the fading moon into the breaking dawn. I've never seen the morning rays shed so little light. It's dark, it's dark. It's dark as hell, and the sun is shining bright. I turned my back on the rising sun, and then began my fight. I turned my back on the rising sun, and was sucked into the endless night.